of our humanity is a cry of the heart for infinite fulfillment. Fear keeps that cry imprisoned. Hope sets it free. I've been telling my story to audiences around the world since the 1990s, but not like this. Why? Fear. It was November 1996. Wendy and I were celebrating our first wedding anniversary. We were at a gathering with some friends and somebody said, so how's the first year of marriage been? I said, you know, a lot of people find first year of marriage pretty tough, but for Wendy and for me, it's been easy. Years later, my wife would tell me, that's when I knew you were utterly clueless. We had our ups and downs like any married couple, but Honestly, I thought the first 10 years of marriage were great. I had a great wife, I had great kids, I had a great career, I was traveling the world as a best-selling author and lecturer. And right around the 10-year mark of our marriage, I was offered a very lucrative book deal from the biggest publishing house in the world. My ship had come in, or so I thought. Little did I know, my ship was taking on water. And I would come to learn through various trials that I was wearing a lot of masks in my life. And I was looking to my marriage to fill that deep cry of my heart that only the infinite can fill. I remember the first time I felt it, this cry of the heart, this hunger for life. I was eight years old, I was lying in my bed, and Bruce Springsteen came on the radio singing his anthem, Born to Run. At the end of the song, he just opens his rib cage and lets this cosmic cry come out of his heart. Whoa, whoa, hmm, oh, 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 man, I felt it. Whatever Springsteen wanted, I wanted it too. It was the cry for something infinite. Tragedy is, in all my years of Catholic schooling, nobody ever connected the dots for me between that cry of the heart that I felt so passionately and God. I was raised on what you might call the starvation diet gospel. The basic message was your desires are bad, you need to repress all that, but follow all these rules and you'll be a good upstanding citizen. I don't know about you, but if that's all the church has to offer, no wonder so many people like me leave for what you might call the fast food gospel, which is the secular culture's promise of immediate gratification for the hunger. I left in my teen years because the fast food looked a heck of a lot better than starving myself. But all the grease and the sodium caught up to me in my college years. It was 1988, and I had the tragic experience of witnessing a date rape in a college dorm. This experience haunted me, and it compelled me to ask some really big questions about the meaning of life, about the meaning of love, about what is it in us as human beings that can lead us to treat other human beings as nothing but objects for our selfish pleasure. I wasn't guilty of date rape myself, but I had to ask myself, was I much better in the way I thought about women, in the way I fantasized, when I was looking at porn, when I was in bed with my girlfriend? I remember this ragged prayer coming out of my heart. I fell on my knees and I said, God in heaven, if you exist, you better show me, and you better show me why you gave me all these desires, because they're getting me and everybody I know into a hell of a lot of trouble. What is your plan? Seek and you'll find, right? I sought and what I found 
was the teaching of John Paul II called the Theology of the Body. This crazy Polish Pope told me that this deep well of desire within me had a name. He called it Eros. Now, true enough, if we follow our erotic desires only at the surface, they lead us to the fast food. But I was learning in this theology of the body that if we go to the depths of our erotic longings, they'll launch us like a rocket to the stars. John Paul II helped me to realize that Christianity is not a starvation diet. It's an invitation to a feast of life and love that is literally out of this world. This was a revolution for me. I knew then that I would spend the rest of my life studying this theology of the body and sharing it with the world. I had the privilege in graduate school of studying the Pope's teaching under a personal friend of John Paul II's. An overweight, chain-smoking, salty-tongued, disheveled priest named Monsignor Lorenzo Albacetti. I loved this man. I pursued a friendship with him and he would become a mentor to me over 20 years. He had something I desperately needed, freedom. This was a man who knew he was loved in all his broken, imperfect humanity and he was a man without masks. I, on the other hand, was so bound up. I was wearing so many masks. God has a way of revealing our masks to us, usually through various storms that come in our lives. The first storm hit for me when I told Wendy the title of that book that that big New York publisher wanted me to write. It was a book for husbands called Loving Her Rightly should have seen the look on my wife's face when I told her that title. I was like, what, what, what's the problem? She said, honey, you and I need to talk and it's gonna be long and it's gonna be painful. The message was loud and clear. I was in no place to be writing a book for husbands called Loving Her Rightly. Maybe for the first time in 10 years of married life, I received the grace to listen to my wife. I didn't pursue that book deal. Instead, over the course of many weeks, I let Wendy tell me what it was like to be married to the Theology of the Body guy for the last 10 years. She was right. It was long and it was painful. Now, I don't want to paint the wrong picture here. We're all full of wheat and weeds, right? I wasn't crazy to think I had a great marriage. There was a lot of wheat in my marriage. There are also a lot of weeds and I wasn't looking at them. I was too afraid. In some ways, Wendy was married to a little boy. I was stuck in a bunch of lies I had believed as a kid about what made somebody lovable and what made somebody unlovable. Remember the cool kids growing up? I had to be one of them. It's all a facade, of course, that covers up a deep fear of rejection. Growing up, I lived in constant comparison and judgment. And these patterns of thinking and behaving created a toxic perfectionism in me that was wreaking havoc in my marriage. The next storm came when an interview I had done for Nightline aired on national television. ABC News had put a rather lewd spin on some of my comments, and a lot of people took this at face value. My critics came out of the woodwork. Various bishops, cardinals, and theologians spoke out strongly in my defense. At the same time, the public scrutiny took its toll on me. The perfectionist is always worried about having his flaws on display. And I had to admit that not everything my critics were saying was unfounded. I was a man in crisis. I was in a downward spiral and I was taking a lot of people with me. I ended up taking a six month sabbatical to regroup do some deep soul searching and receive some intensive care from my spiritual director. I 
take a personal retreat each year. And on one of these retreats, the priest said, Christopher, prayer is an exercise of desire. On this retreat, I want to help you get in touch with your deepest desires. Oh man, I had no idea what was about to happen. Sure enough, following his lead, I started getting in touch with some of my deepest desires, things I just hadn't looked at for eons. They came welling up and with these desires came anger. I mean rage at God. And I had it out with God. I was so angry that God had given me all these desires and just seemed to leave me in them without any hope of fulfillment. I said, God, I get it. I get it why people are atheists. I get it why people don't believe in you. Why do you give us all these desires just to leave us to wait? What the beep is that? Oh man, it felt good. Something just broke open in me, this well of desire and rage. And man, I felt alive. I also felt conflicted. And I went right back to the priest. I said, Father, it's been three hours since my last confession. And I told him what I said. And I'll never forget his response to me. He said, good prayer. Good prayer. Good prayer, he said. You just prayed your own version of Psalm 22 in union with Jesus. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He said, you don't need to confess that you got honest with God. You need to confess that you haven't been honest with God. You need to confess that you've been wearing all these masks. Now you're taking them off. That's prayer. Prayer is where we get naked before God so he can love us as we really are. I thought, man, if this is prayer, it's making me feel pretty raw, weak, and exposed. But that retreat started me on a whole new journey of learning how to get naked before my maker. I was learning that oh so important lesson that really takes us to the heart of the Christian life. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. During my sabbatical, when it seemed all my weaknesses were on display to the whole world, I felt so unworthy. I felt like such a fraud. And it seemed almost impossible to me that I could continue doing this work. One day, my spiritual director spoke right into the problem. He says, Christopher, you think a saint is someone who has somehow overcome his or her broken humanity. Nope. A saint, he said, is someone who has all of his or her broken humanity open to the merciful love of the Father. You don't need to be perfect to do this work, he said. No, you need to keep all of your imperfections open to God's merciful love. And that openness becomes the very riverbed through which God can reach other people through you, first your wife, then your children, then the people you're called to teach and mentor. Game changer. After a few years of taking these life lessons to heart, Wendy and I were out to dinner and she said, honey, something's really good in our relationship lately. Don't you feel it? What do you think it is? I thought about it for a moment. I said, yeah, I, I do feel it. And I think I know what it is. I said, I think I finally realized deep in my heart that you can't satisfy me. She got this huge grin on her face and she said, that's exactly it. That's what I've been realizing too. You can't satisfy me either. I'm sure if anyone was overhearing us in the restaurant, they probably thought we were about to get divorced but we never felt closer in all our years of married life. Why? Because we were learning to take our heavy hands off one another and accept and love one another with all our imperfections. We were learning that we were lovable warts and all, like my chain-smoking, disheveled mentor, Monsignor Lorenzo Albacetti. I went to visit Albacetti on the first official feast day of his friend, and my hero, St. John Paul II. 
It was the last time I would see him. He was in a nursing home suffering from an extended illness and he died just two days later. After his funeral, I had a dream about Albacete and it was as if from beyond the grave, he was calling me back to revisit a lesson he had tried to teach me and my classmates 20 years earlier. It was three weeks before my wedding and Albacete was teaching from a short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne called The Birthmark. It's about a perfectionistic husband who couldn't love his wife because of what he considered a blemish on her cheek, but she had always considered a beauty mark. I remember Albacete saying to the class, this man does not know how to love his wife. And I felt an arrow go right through my heart because I knew I was that man. I was treating my wife to be in similar ways. In a flash, I saw this toxic perfectionism in my heart and I had the opportunity to look at it before I got married, but out of fear, I just shut it down. Now, many years later, with Albacete in his grave and with me many steps down the way of my own journey, I went back and read the birthmark again. This time, I let it expose the darkness in my soul that for so many years had caused my wife so much pain. And I trusted this darkness to my wife and her real love for me. I exposed it to the light. I let her love me in my nakedness, and she showed me such a tender mercy. Sometimes I think back on that experience of shutting down my heart all those years ago in Albacete's classroom, and I shudder to think where I would be today if I had remained crippled by my fear. I'd still be crushing the cry of my heart and hiding behind a lot of masks. John Paul II's Theology of the Body is an absolute lifeline in a world that is drowning in confusion about the meaning of life, love, sexuality, and gender. But my life has taught me it's not a quick fix. It calls us on a long journey of transformation, and that takes a leap of faith. The more I've made that leap of faith in my own life, the more I have journeyed from fear to hope. All right, you got the video rolling, man? Yes. All right, get those hands up. Make sure I'm bouncing for you.